Yeah. This was an essay I used to recite in innumerable ways from my school days ever since I heated potassium dichromate in the laboratory of signing school Karakotam under the strange guidance of my esteemed guru Sri N. B. Nair and Balakrishnan Nair fondly addressed by students as NBN, who is passed away into other worlds recently. This essay I tentatively wrote maybe many years ago and uh, had it with me and I published it and almost anybody who knew the way guest of science or even no, not, he had. That is, anybody who knew some science or who did not know science, I would have said this always to show how infinite quantity of scientific research cannot lead us anywhere. It's a dead end. And this is not something, if any person listening to it quotes uh, some third rate Western thinker uh, who wrote it much later, <laughs> probably or somebody else like Feynman, after winning a Nobel Prize or something, they are doing very harmful things for themselves. Because they have already judged me before I say something, which is a great horrible thing. The only thing I stand here is I avoid telling lies and have no desire for any victory or praise by anybody living, dead or to be. The infinite, eternal, cosmic laboratory of Bebel. The infinite, eternal, seamless cosmic laboratory of Bebel. Generated from each point in each universe imaginable past, present, future, otherwise. That would be too much. But I let you, I request you to let your imagination wander with what I'm doing. I have one request to people who are watching this and listening to it. Please don't throw crap at me straight away. Wait for it to be over. Then you open all your infinitudes of <laughs> crapological, accumulate and throw it. Give me the time, yeah. All I have is a lot of pain I bore and a certain truth I pursued. Before I Continue with this. I have one small thing to say. Modern man is in a quandary. I suppose many of you know about uh, the axiom of choice of the Zeramano Franklin Girdle Burnley scheme. If you don't know, I mean, I said what it is, you can check. one life. Enjoy. This is the only principle. Do what you feel like. 
That's all. This is the end of it. This grotesque asseveration, this grotesque statement comes everywhere in all the newspapers, in every news channel. You have one life and you die. I mean, first of all, if you're clinging to that, then please just close this chat of mine. Go on your way. You can drive a car and you can enjoy, you can go to hotels, eat, and you know, do whatever you would sing and dance. And, well, what else can you do? I leave that as an open question. But if you think this life is not the end of it, that mankind didn't come to this earth purposelessly as an unwanted animal and he wanted to be dying, but wondering why I'm dying and not being able to answer. There is something which gets repeated in all the religious texts in one way or the other. That man is chosen. God made man in his own form. Isha was similar. The divine pervades everywhere. Eko Vishnu, Mahabhuta. The one Vishnu became many. That is the one who could spread the infinite seamless universe. He entered into infinite forms. And that is every being from ant to atom, or, or atomic being I meant, and maybe even atom, I'm not sure about that, but well, even that's possible. To every being, fly, dog, donkey, each projecting a vast cosmos, and in each of them, Eko, Vishnu, Mahabhuta, he wanted that supreme infinite, beyond space-time, cognition, beyond beginnings, middles, and end, beyond infinite circular recurrences, beyond beyond itself and beyond infinite linear dimension and beyond infinite chain paths unimaginable by man, men and God the life. Well, that echo Vishnu, one infinite existed and it wanted to know about itself and it spread in its vast, seamless, infinite desire to perceive itself and thus this cosmos was created. If somebody wants to know, where did you get that idea from? Which book you read? Well, it's a very difficult thing for me to say. Because I didn't read any book to know this. Even as a child, because my mother told me a story of an all pervasive Vishnu, Narayana, curiously, that's my name too, which Prahlava, the divine Asuri, king, asserted, as a prince asserted to his terrifying father here in Thus I grew on that simplest of faith that there's an all privacy God everywhere. And there is a legend that ran in my family that I used to pick up stray objects like this and you know, anything, so powder puff, toothbrush, child's, you know, my brother was a child, his nipples, you know, which was given for his feeding water. Anything, cloth, I mean, everything I would pick up and ask my mother, is Narayana there? And she said, of course, it must be there. And I believed her. That's all. And that's my first teacher. And I've learned nothing more than that. Who told my mother? I went and asked her. She heard it from the legends hearsay. And I heard through her. So she's my first guru. And the second one is my father. He said, son, never tell a lie. Even if it's a priest. Even if you are the most difficult circumstances. Because... The truth is what really matters. And he used to tell me a very important story, which is well known in all the all over the world in different forms. A shepherd goes, a young boy goes with the lambs into the forest, and, uh, and he tells her he's bored and watching the lambs, and he shouts, you know, a, a, a tiger has come, and all the villagers run to save him, and he laughs at them. <laughs> no tiger came, you're all fools. He repeated it a few times and then finally when a, a tiger came and when he screamed there was nobody to help him. This is a parable my father taught me. So there it was my life and there it was my faith and that's what I'm saying. And uh, well, what all did I read? That's an entirely different thing. And which book I read up to what page, even that, I almost always remember. There are very few, few books I read to completion. I never thought by reading a book I become knowledgeable, but that every bit, arrogantly, or certainly, 
that I honor the person who wrote that book by me, I reading it. That's it, yeah. And somebody is going to say, you are a very vain fellow. No, I'm not vain. Because there are innumerable books. Where are the time? Where's the time for me to read all of them? For example, there's one small parable I'd like to say in this context. That, uh, for example, some books are simply touched and threw off. Kant's Critic of Pure Reason, the original text. I wrote this aphorism. Kant thought, Gautama sought that Gautama, the Buddha, that is Siddhartha from Kapilavastu. Kant wrote and Gautama found. This actually perspective defined the Eastern and the Western way of basic thinking itself. This is not easily understood. That is, you crank and think, write books, and you define, and you are in a terrain. But Gautama, the Buddha, didn't Siddhartha. He sought, his whole being sought, and every seeking thought from his mind, feeling, went and spread into the universe. Because all he was interested in was to know. And that is the whole thing of yoga, tantra, mantra, of water, the great sages and saints of yonder day, whether it is the various Indian schools of Buddhists and you know, Hindu, the Nath yogis, the Kriya yogis, and Bhakti yogis, and the Western ones of uh, like uh, the Gnostics and the Sufis, and innumerable ones. Those who thought one could find, they all passed through various stages, and each went through one path and dissolved himself in that infinite light which he couldn't even fathom. That was the glorious thing. That's a very, you know, like I always as a child had certain curious doubts. If uh, an author base is divine, Narayana or Vishnu or Narasimha or whatever, Isha or Ishiha or Wahabi, Allah is there, why doesn't he manifest? Why is there so much? By then, I believe, I saw my grandmother die. I knew vaguely people cry when people die and you don't know where they go. And these questions were, how, how can I say, mushrooming in my being and that's the way I began. And I really don't, I'm not very sure, I really don't know why I'm even making this talk or why. Only thing which defines me is the vast universes that have been conjured that pass through my seamless consciousness. For example, now go back, now let's do a simple thought experiment. This moment I'm sitting here with my, my friend and uh, my, my somebody who is, I can't explain, I leave it there. Son, say, he's sitting in front and he's listening. So I'm talking to him and there's a camera standing ahead. The whole universe, the city of Bangalore, and this, you know, what do you call the universe all around, unimaginable number of universes. Apart for that, I will give a small hint. This is something which I knew as a kid, which I'll be reading in the next essay. That is uh, what I, the ant has thousand eyes, the butterfly has a pupil stage and an eye, the cow, every animal you can conceive. Those in the biological ladder, as culled by the Aristotelian obsession, which led to the Darwinian conjecture, etc., and also through, how can you explain it, through innumerable imaginary beings, say, and the book of imaginary beings written by George A. Louis Borges, even they, anything imagined is there, so to say. And these innumerable beings all perceive one vast human unimaginable by anybody except by the one who perceives it. Perceives it. And that is this Eko Vishnu Mahaputta, the infinite all pervading us, turned into infinitudes of beings and each perceived an absurd, unimaginable, perfect, divine, pure, sacred. I have amateur loss of words, immortal words. There was no need of any death. It was infinite pre primordial Edens created in unimaginable sanctity and purity of the unimaginably undefinable one, which is a beautiful 
definition of God or the divine in the Vishnu Sarasana. Adhya Purusha Sakshi, the supreme witness of it all, everywhere, all over. Adhya also means undefinable because we've come to that again. Definitions carry the burden of the Euclidean limitation, the infinite regressing why gets embedded in each answer. Like you say, what's a point? Well, a point is something, just no area. What's an area? Thus, if you assume that that word has makes no sense and you want a definition, the definition goes on infinitely regressing. The whole Euclidean system comes because Euclid wanted to avoid that. Yeah. And the first, for, for, first uh, part of elements, which I haven't really read, I haven't even seen, must be beginning with the undefined terms. Those terms we cannot define. If you define them, you will keep going into this strange regressing. Why? You say that's why. Why, why, why? About one another. There's one Sanskrit aphorism I've written, which I told so many people. And some guys are even telling it to everybody without even saying I said it. Not that it matters. Kim Prashnam. Ekam prashnam kupar 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 aho kupar. Now if I say Shankaracharya wrote it, Buddha wrote it or something, I have no problem. You should write it. Because you are a born guy, you know. Just let me get all equal. You know. Yes, yeah. And we'll come to that later. But then, yeah, incidentally, yes, we're talking to Shyam. I asked Arun, I'm asking you, uh, my Kovan, who wrote this aphorism? And then he said, if you uh, no price, I mean, nothing given, but then he said, Shankaracharya. I said, no, no. I mean, I wrote to Shankaracharya, didn't write that. The Shankaracharya just closed his eyes and flipped it off. He said, it's not being asked. It's a kutap prashna. Who is always a kutarka for bad argument? Tarkam is, one has faith in what one is saying. Not <laughs> that faith shows what is kutarka. That's all man is doing. He can add, I want it that way, guide me. What can he do? That's what I hear all around. The horriblest thing. Just come to this moment. I didn't want to say it. The earth is rotating, I suppose. We can assume. Cosmosis, maybe. Innumerable, innumerable perception. And there are children and even infants being tortured and I won't say, I won't use the word, molested, raped. I have no word for it. And people who are infants, the owners of the infants, permit this for petty pains. That is surely the end days clearly visible. In the end days, what will happen? They have been written in all the books. And here again, we will come to the levels of end days, infinite times. The end days have come. Infinite time, the apocalypse has come. Infinite times, Christ has come, crucified in Golgotha, born, born as an immaculate child in Bethlehem. And infinite times, anything you've imagined, or the Desha avatar of Vishnu, or the 23, as it is mentioned in Mahagotha, and the 27 Bhutas, etc., etc., and finally culminating in a Maitreya Bhutta, who has a sword in his thing. And, and uh, who is also Kalki, says all those things have happened. And well, the Shambhu's avatar, which are beyond even this, he says, first Bindu of Kala Chakra can change all the past forever, innumerable times. That is, now we'll come to what I wanted to say. My memory be betrayed me. What I wanted, wanted to say was this moment when Sham is sitting, and I'm sitting here. We assume, we were sitting a little before here, you know, in the some positions like the order. And between these two seconds, innumerable cosmoses have been born and dissolved. And from this moment, if you go back in time, there are infinite paths leading to infinite primordialities. Each what's called the Vichitra Satya Spanda Bindu. This is a word I'm making for the tentative discourse. That is stretch your mind to infinite pre primordiality. Each with Another bindu, then the sound, the divine word is uttered. It was in uttered 
with power. Yeah, that is Big Bang. No, no, it is not Big Bang at all. No. It is something. Big Bang, nobody heard because there is no hearing. This is that infinite bindus thoughts with that divine nada bindus were created. This is again a parable to be received in the in the allegoric divine rhythm of the parable instead of reducing it to a petty statement of a business magnate kindly. At the, at the primordiality, innumerable. So the universe does not have a simple origin at all. It is innumerable origin, countable, yet infinite. And if you want to make it infinite and uncountable to, to cater to the, to the ignorant vanity of Cantor and the Zermano Franke creators and the Girdle Bunnies creators, and my Indian friend, who have insistently told me, come on, don't try to be very smart, you fellow. They're all great white people. They care to be more intelligent. We are petty fellows, third world, you know. They've given it to me in various ways. I won't name them. They are no longer significant. But the pain I went through, through this thing was very terrible. But then before, now I think I'll proceed. We have gone through innumerable pain. And then assume we read this moment, and then this moment continues in innumerable ends, in innumerable ways. And then we've shifted back to all the moments we leave throughout the life and converted them to all the possibilities. I can hear some distant fellow saying, hey, that's not very smart, that's done in science, virtual world. When did that come? And that is a junk statistical idea. This is not that. This is the idea of seeing, you know, the inner seer. You don't need statistics or you know coins to think like that at all. And again, this another thing, which is something which everybody says, you know, that's one aphorism I've written. Every action, like I do this, has infinite tubes of reactions, in infinite tubes of cosmos as past, present, future, otherwise forever. That's all. And it is even if all the measuring instruments of the universe are like used. The spot of it can't be measured. That is what I'm affirming. Because that's the truth. Nothing can be done about it. Because uh, now somebody will say, you know, meteorologists are saying the butterfly effect from Africa. <laughs> I don't know where they got it from. They got original thinking. It was something every petty Indian Swamiji knew. You understand? Even the idiots, and even the mothers and grandmothers, and all the ancients and all the communities knew your action is related to everything in the universe and you are not an isolated, individual, original entity. Unless you are syncretically, holistically related to all, you don't exist at all. Now the synthetic holistic has come into the vocabulary out of fears and necessity. And the, for the amount I have wept and prayed for that to come in, it's simply unimaginable. You mean you start? No, I didn't start. I wept and wept and wept everywhere. Oh God, Shambhu, Kimartam, Pratyaksham, Sarvam, Nasamayam, Jagat. Because, I'd say another aphorism. I said about uh, the infinite, non-localized reaction of infinite cosmoses. And everybody is participating in the seamless, infinite, non-localization of innumerable cosmoses. Nobody can delay it because it is the rhythm, it is the subject. And that rhythm is what created all the infinite pervasive Vishnu, Vishnu Maya, Prapancham, the rig section. They are the rig Veda, rhythm, rig. And that English rhythm is a direct derivative of Sanskrit rhythm. This is told to me by my friend Pramod Nenna in English. Not that that's important. But still, I felt like acknowledging him there. Or did he say that? <laughs> I mean, where did he so? Mm, yeah. So these rigs are there. And from this rig where that came, the, from the pervasive, rig means a center. No, say, no, you, there are lots of people who go, oh, this thing is very nice, you know, Phil Kilden, a mantra that ohm is E equals MC squared. Such crap is being written. Please don't do that. You will go to hell. You will go to hell. That's all. 
Why not just e equals mc squared plus mc cubed? mc raised to infinity, sigma put before. Why not? For every conceivable law, there exists innumerable universes that operate according to that law. The description of the system, any system, is not the system. The universe contains innumerable descriptions of the whole and every detail of the system, innumerably, and still it's incomprehensible. That's why the ancients wrote Abhyaya Purusha, Abhyaya. Can't be. More I know, the less I know for a thing. And there's another thing which my father used to tell me. He used to tell me, he, this Vishnu Sahasranamu, I heard from my father when I was a child. He recited the Vishnu Sahasranamu to me as a child in a fifth or sixth class, I think, sixth class, and fifth maybe. And I used to sit with him. And these are two words he explained. Another one was Anud Brahat. That is smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. My father brought up in the scientific age, pseudo scientific age, of, as a civil engineer, had even read Hal Dane, who said body is a machine or something. So he had to, you know, give the he had to he had to feel that his Vishnu Sahasranamu is valid even to the arrogant scientific circles, so called scientific. Anyway, Anurbriha, from the smallest to the biggest. Now again, for everything you think about the smallest to the biggest, reading the sasana, always be aware of these things. A reaction, has, that is a non-localization. And Einstein, in his meaning of relativity, in one of those, I, I saw it recently, but I knew it a long time ago before. I, as a kid, I used to do this, you know. I used to play the, the English Indian cricket team, <laughs> win by, you know, moving this, and I used to tell my brother about the non-localization, and speak through here, you know. That's very childlike. And my brother Raju said there was some British kid, he read somewhere, who used to you know, do similar things and make England win against Australia. I mean, so I told you that also. This sort of truth you cannot do. Because people are so obsessed. I did it. <laughs> I've done nothing. If at all I've done anything, even only errors, anything good in what we say, just come. Now, we come from this moment, we went back to innumerable pre-primordial universes. We know floating through innumerable Heraclitian magic as innumerable rivers of perception to innumerable ends. Space, time, ends, finish. And finally, almost all have heard the divine Mauna Vyakhyanam of Dakshinamurthi, which Shankaracharya beautifully described. Chitram Vatataro Mule Vridha Shisha Guru Yuva Gurostu Maunam Vyakyanam Shishyastu Chin Samshaya. That is, I'll try to translate into English. Strange is a spectacle under the divine banyan tree. There sits a youthful young guru and he speaks with Chin Mudra in his hand. And all the disciples are silent. And his mauna vyakyana, his elucidations in mauna, which is not exactly silence, we'll come to that, clarified all doubts to everyone. Because he was a guru of gurus. Gurave sarva bhutana vishaje bhavaro dhima. Oh, guru of gurus of all beings. And who is the curer of every disease? That's what he said. Vyoma vat vyapta dehaya Whose body spreads into the infinite. Dakshina murtaye namaha As we talked about silent and you know, the slight talking. There are, in, in general, there are three major types of silences described in ancient Hindu, Indian, Puranic texts and everywhere. One is the zone of no, no sound, nishabdam. That is, it is not elucidatory. It just is defined not by a negative method. The uh, is a sound. And that's a sound. But then, that's not plant. This is what's called the Brazonian effect in cinematic <laughs> parlance. <laughs> when the dog comes into the temple, take that also. 
and make it very natural. Yeah. <laughs> Material reality. <laughs> now there are the, uh, the kind of those of uh, what is it? They will say, see? Nonsense. Uh, Nonsense. <laughs> Nishabdam. Nishabdam is a. Uh, and then there is a fearsome mukam. Yeah. Neither sound nor silence has formed. Shambhu. I would rather not think about it. And that is the whole idea of this mukasura in, in, uh, in Mukhamita. There was one, I'm not sure exactly how this Mukhasara came to me. He came to, as a part of the seamless, fearsome proof. It must be Shambhu himself who can keep that sort of mukha. And the, and the Mukhasara who can't even. And that Mukhasara could be killed due to some metaphysical reasons. It must be described in the Purana by only the Devi. And, the, and uh, Mukhasara was killed by the Devi, so that the state of no sound <laughs> and, uh, you know, and sound, neither of them is Mukha, just a reaction. You know, is how, how do we describe that in English? It is what, what we may call the most painful, mournful of silence, roughly. But he still doesn't describe that. And then the third one, Nishabdam Mukham. Mukham, most undesirable. And Nishabdam is there in the divine, unimaginable Kari Mandala. The Devi takes infant tapas to invoke Shambhu to open his mouth and talk. Say why? He asked the question why. First, want to ask why to Shiva was the Devi herself, and then this creation innumerably began, roughly again. And then the Mauna Vyakyana is the end of it. Then he elucidates in silence the meaning of everything everybody wants to know in their personal tongue. Each understands language differently. Each speaks a different language, from the bird to animal to the particle to man, to speaks to all simultaneously. That mauna, that is, I don't think anybody in the universe has been there. Maybe Shankaracharya did. Others he could have made that shlokam. And the Shankaracharya himself, as we said, eternally recurring infinite times. It's not true. That is also there in the Vishnu Purana. Vishnu Sarasana, not Purana. That must be also there in both places. Samavarto Nivartatma, the Brahmin is presided with God. Samavarto Nivartatma, Samavarto Nivartatma. One who makes all the infinite cyclic recurrences, who clears and cleanses them, that is the name means. So when Nietzsche, picking up the strand from the Greek, Greco thought, which must have most probably gone from the Eastern way, maybe during the time of Alexander or something, because there are various things related to that, and maybe Protinus, I'm not very sure. But then, the Nietzsche eternal return becomes an affirmation. It was a vainglorious final curve. Just imagine that you walk through this, I'll do it infinite times, repeat. And Nishi at that time, when he went mad, he suffered this eternal rigor. Maybe I can do a demo of what he felt, but I think I'll do it another time, how he walked with those fierce eyes. And as an Indian, shall I use the word philosopher, the only Western philosopher, maybe after Socrates and Aristotle said that he has to even be able to think about his niche himself because it is the final curse on a man. But yet, the beginning of the final possibility of the apocalypse. 
because not the apocalypse. Even the closure has come infinitely. Infinite apocalypse, infinite perfection, infinite dharma samstapana, but still the why is not answered. Let's know that. I think I'll regress a little bit and go back. I didn't want to talk like this. I wanted to read something and with something in my in my lap on the laptop, but still I'm talking off the cuff. From childhood, I was always interested. Hey, why doesn't Prashada could see? Why couldn't everybody see? Why doesn't the infinite manifest? And as a kid, I used to go to temples and search, you know. I thought he may come as an ant or a butterfly or some vague old man, you know. Always, I used to keep this all previous. You know? Yes, yeah. And he always was waiting to ask him only one question. Why? <laughs> the most kudarka problem. Why you didn't leave that mountain which you lifted in Vrindavan, there itself? So scientists would have a proof. He sees it, proof, but uh, oh, why, you know? The Kaliga Madhana, etc., etc. Everything, all the miracles. Oh, Shankaracharya brings, you know, they say, gold coins you know, for, an, for an old woman because she had no money. But he doesn't repeat it. Not every day, you know. Can I ever say the gold production, competition, Jigjan, and Webster will all sit together and put his gold coin. And who makes the maximum number of coins? Things in a way prize with the gold he made, say I mean. <laughs> So that's the sort of thing which is happening now. Hmm? No. There's one beautiful aphorism, Sri Aurobindo wrote, let me repeat it. Great saints have performed miracles. Greater saints have raised against them. The greatest have both performed them and raised against them. That's extraordinary. But the greater than all of them, he doesn't do anything. He performs odd miracles and no miracles and still doesn't even shrug his shoulder. It is that we are finally should head for. Because the closure has come infinite times. Because closure assumes a beginning and middle and end. That has happened. But it's beyond that also. So I've come to that in my childhood. So I was, I was never bothered about the old avatars and old things. Of course, I read Christ, you know, the story, everything. Later, accidentally in a book, everything was random fatality. And then I, I always, uh, accidentally, I, you know, like, uh, I knew about the avatar coming. That first time, I think, I saw the immense force in, in a place in Paripa, where I was born, in, you know, not near a village where I stayed as a child, and I was born near that place. It is a Shiva temple, originally called Paripa. It's not Paripa. Paripa means a seed, I mean, like a, th like a, what do you call it, th Thordal, I mean, what they say. And, but it was Paripa. This etymology was actually revealed to me by somebody known to me called Jay Kumar, who was an IAS officer, who was known to me in coffee house days, who became a secretary of the, of the Kerala government, which is the highest position he could reach. And he also knew me in those days, anyway. Uh, so he said Bharipa, because I accent, you know, that story is out of context here, so I told it. So Agastya made that uh, Shivalingam there, that Shivalingam was kept by Agastya, Agastya Muni in Kerala. That's what the legend runs. A lot of legends about that, they forget all that. There there's a place called Kala Art. Kala Art means, uh, it's a very difficult word, I mean. Where the bull is tamed and you know held you know, or something like that. And I was told by Narayanan, my uncle's son, who was again like my son, that in Shabarimala there's on the way there's a place called Kala something, where after Shabarimala Shasta destroys Mahishi, he dances in ecstasy. And at that time, Shiva and Parati come to watch it. You know? I mean, that's why that place name gets it. Anyway, did that, that he came. There are, you know, mythologies. But one aphorism may be relevant from my book. The difference between mythology or mythology and reality is merely a later mythology. That again we can keep. So every action has infinite reactions. All the cosmoses could infinitely, psychically come and go eternally. All the past can be changed. So in this Kala Atta I mentioned in the temple in, in Paripur, it's a Ganapati temple. 
there used to be very nice uh, butter, there used to be heat it a lot. And I found on the walls the Shah And I used to see it and you know, Masya, Kodma, Varaha. I'm not going to talk about them because they all exist in various books. And finally the Kalki. So that the Kalki was the one that interested me. When is this final avatar going to come? That's a, you know, like, because I had to meet uh, this uh, Prakrada's Narasimha somewhere. So I said, you know, that sort of thing was getting, you know, rotating in my mind. Then I remember, you know, like uh, certain Krishna paintings of Vishnu and all the Desha avatars and whatever it is. Then I was 17, 18, you know, around the time I wanted to write an, an epic novel called Kalki, the last Kalki, which I never did. Each had a prelude and an end, which was a parable. A father and his little kid son go into some big forest here, they, they roam. Father teaches the son the names of the plants, animals, of the bird. They hear a very dirty, horrifying, painful sound. <laughs> sort of sound magnified to fear some infinity. So the son asks father, Hey father, what is that sound, my dear father? Son's father says, I don't know son, but I'm told by ancient that's a huge well. Nobody should go and look into it because it is very terrible and painful. It will lead to hell and that sort of thing. But this curious son was strange and, and when your father was not there, one day he goes and sees there into that well, the forbidden well, of ultimate darkness and hell. There was innumerable beings all glued into, coagulated into a viciously suffering form. What was roughly described in the Ramayana as a Kabandha. And this Kabandha has been killed infinite number of times by Rama. Kabandha Bahu Chedaka Ram in the Ramayana short form, or Hanuman Chalice, I think, that Rama is, yeah, Ramayana short version, that is the Kabanda. The Kabanda was one with a, with a huge body with so many limbs and so many eyes and every organ infinity, but no coordination. You know? I mean, you put everything into itself. And Rama and Lakshmana destroy the Kabanda again and again in each of the cycle, which we could conceive. Also, traditionally, it is said the 27th or the 28th so day of Brahma. And just we try to refer to one that. Adya Brahmana, Diya Varadhe, Shveda Varaha Kalpe, Vaiva Sudha Manundare, Pradhamun, Yuntu Dribe, Bharata Varshe, this is the mantra of the Brahmin to say. Suppose we 27th or 20th, I think it is 27th, that way the stars are 27th. 27th day of Brahma, so to say. And each Brahma's day, is one Brahma Kalpa. The cycles come. And Vishnu in his parvasi breathes it in all over. That everything, nothing is there. And similarly it has happened 27. But then why should we stop at 27? Let's make it countable infinity. I'm sorry. I'm scared of uncountability because I don't understand it still. I'm trying. So and the great uh, wizard Malayalam, I think I'll come to that later, it's not relevant. So we have come to the end of cycles and there's something, still the residue is there. You know, that is the fear of Shishta, Shta, Vishta, Shishta, Shuti, that's one of Vishnu Sasundaris. One was fond of the residues and uh, in the supreme, unimaginable way, cleanses the residues. That is also perhaps essentially done, but still. Nothing has begun in the infinite water with you. So I said, uh, the tremendous vastness of time has been seen, and uh, the whole of Sudarshana of Vishnu, which is due to Krishna and the Avatar, that is normally a linear chakra. It, 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 it corrects, I mean, like, it does this. But then the Kala chakra, it is shambles. It goes behind. It sees and cleanses everything. It absorbs the infinite sins of infinite child molesters, etc. Ad absurdum infinitum. Oh, 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 
and that was a poison. He was drinking at every, <laughs> every cool Mahavatar, Vishnu becomes the doctor, bearing the burden, and his own counterpart, Shiva, drinks all the poison. Till the, till the gods and demons couldn't close it, because again, Raku and Ketu get him for some divine necessity, get immortalized. And Raku is a time factor. So they say Raku Kala, this time is auspicious. This time. And the Ketu is the Kuta Prashna we define. Kuta, 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 Aho, Kuta. And that is the whole idea of this whole Asuri Shakti that is there. That's a powerful, most powerful of Shakti. Anyway, so we were on this earth and we are, we are in terrible times because uh, in, in some way we are in, the, in, 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 a, in a transformational state beyond space, time, infinity, eternity, past, present, future, etc. Et I leave it there. So I come back to this moment. Should I say something? Yeah, yeah I was talking about Einstein, which is left an open end. Einstein says, if you don't assume localization, there's no science possible. Because he knew at least what, he knew the limitation of what you see, which most of these ones don't even think about. Most of them don't, because they have no time. They just wonder how I can push my paper <laughs> into Oxford and Cambridge and have a meeting in. Anyway, I think I, I will close this tentative and proceed. We ought to be going endlessly into vagaries. Is that the right version? I believe so. And continue. Or I'll give it a new etymological interpretation. The infinite, eternal, seamless, cosmic laboratory of Bebel, an essay. First, I'll read the notes because there are some words which may be useful to those who don't know the language of Sanskrit. Vishnu, or pervasive, lord of all the universes. Ramayana, ancient in Indian epic describing the glory of Lord Vishnu in his avatar as Sri Rama. Bhagavatam, Indian Puranam describing the glory of Vishnu in his Krishna avatar. Just uh, the word Puranam, I may have to clarify. Puranam is so ancient, nobody knows when it originated. That's what it means. I mean, I can give Sanskrit interpretation for the etymology of the world. Pura, pura, purvam, aranam, iti, dikbanda. That is, through every being it was revealed, through so many sources, most sources nobody can gather, so to say, yes. Uh, I have described it. Puranam, that which is divine and known from ancient times, there are 18 major Puranams. And 18 minor ones. Yeah. Itihasam, great epic. Uh, <coughs> Sham, how do I go behind? Can you help me? <coughs> I want to go back. Yeah. This is not working. Like, you know, above, yeah? yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Itihasam, great EP, refers to Ramayana, Ramayana, and the much larger Mahabharata, Mahabharata, right? Shiva Purana, the Purana deals with the cosmic mystery of Shiva and Shakti, Brahman, that which is all this and not all this. Hmm, okay. Now I come to this essay. My childhood was all a great mythological world. I not only believed in God and also believed that I will encounter him in one of his infinite manifestations anytime because I was perpetually praying. I also thought that everybody must be doing the same. My desire to see God in one of his forms was not for any special favors, but for knowledge of God and his great mystery. 
My first heroes were the two legendary child bhaktas, devotees of God, Prakrata and Dhruva. Both these blessed children, by the intensity of their devotion, actually see God, Narayana, Lord Vishnu, when they just pass their infancy. Prakrada, by absolute faith, and Dhruva, by absolute tapas, rigorous penance and meditation, achieve these impossible feats. These stories were told to me by my mother. It seems that as a two-year-old child, I used to pick up random objects and ask my mother whether Lord Narayana was there in Dantu. And my mother would say yes. I learned about the omnipresence of God from the great legend of Prakrata. For more details of Prakrata and Dhruva, see Vishnu Puranam. Late, little later, I also heard of Krishna from the Bhagavatam and Sri Rama from the Ramayana and Shiva from Shiva Puranam from my mother, father and my mother's mother, all great storytellers in their own right. These myths are an intrinsic part of the Indian psyche. They are transmitted more through speech than by writing. Many TV serials and cinema have been made, especially recently, on these grand mystic legends from the Itihasas and the Puranas. When I was about five, my hero was the great Indian prophet, Shankaracharya, who expounds Advaita Vedanta, absolute unity and perfect non-dualism of the infinite Brahman. A little later, Buddha also entered as a great divine mortal. I read about Christ's birth in a senior cousin's school book when I was seven or so, and I must have read it dozens of times. I was deeply impressed, and I always used to think of Christ's glory when I visited our cowshed in Pandaram with Gauri and a calf Meena. When I was 11 years old, I joined Sainik School, Karakotam, Tirumanandapuram, a boarding school training possible future officers for the Indian Armed Forces. It was very different from my faithful mythological worlds of wonders. I was terribly homesick, but somehow managed. I got deeply interested in Euclid ge Euclid's geometry taught by Sri S. Iyer, and, and the next year, 1966, my illustrious chemistry teacher, Sri N. B. Nair, in the first class, made us heat sodium dichromate in the school chemistry lab. That experiment was a turning point in my life, of my life, and I thought that I must study all of the science that I must study all of the sciences in God. I thought I'd be the eternal scientist, eternally seeking truth in a laboratory that grew bigger and bigger in my imagination within a short while. It started as a large five-story building for physics, chemistry, botany, zoology, and mathematics. But then it grew into the very laboratory Weber itself. Let me elucidate. Physics I recognize as a fundamental science, since biology re reduced to chemistry and chemistry reduced to physics. Ever since I heard of elementary particles of physics, 1965-80, I wondered why they couldn't be indefinitely split again and again into an absolute 
infinitesimality with the microscopic was the vast, sorry, pardon me, I made a mistake here. The absolute infinitesimality. The laboratory had to be infinite and research has to be done for infinite time. This is clearly an eternal impossibility for science since science is a finite pastime like carpentry. Contrasting with the microscopy was a vast macroscopy, just as the microscopes indefinitely magnify the small, there was the infinite possibility of telescopes, again an infinite, eternal, indefinite process. I used to imagine galaxies into, I used to imagine galaxies into a universe, make that universe an infinitesimal particle, make vaster universe again repeat the deed eternally, infinitely. I was thinking of the set of all experiments in all the universes, past, present, futures, or otherwise. I remember suggesting a series of experiments which had given me the Newton's law of cooling. I remember telling about this to my respected physics teacher, Sri K. M. Nair, Science School Karakutam, who clarified this to me. I also thought of parsing the spectrum hmm, through all organic concoctions and see what happens. Chlorophyll solution in the chemistry laboratory and the spectrum I knew from physics opened out this vast possibility. I, later in college, I recognized that I was seeing the vast region of spectroscopy. I also thought of experimenting the effect of magnetic field or electromagnetic fields to various physical phenomena like specific heat and other properties of various substances, crystal growth, etc. There was a crazy doubt I had a little later, 1968, about gravitation. I wondered that if every object, include human beings, attracted every object, according to Newton's law of gravitation, then why don't all the people in the classroom collide as objects? Later, I recognized that it was the famous many-body problem of physics in disguise and sometimes afterwards that physics is a fantastic human fiction, not absolute truth at all. Chemistry, for first region that attracted my attention was the vast possibility of biochemistry on the earth and all over the vast universes, infinite experimental and theoretical possibility in the grand laboratory of the Bell. Transuranium elements made me wonder what infinite non-discovered elements of the infinite periodic table. Obviously, all chemistry becomes the infinite regressing journey of eternal micro one, two, three, infinity of physics of what we may call meta nanoparticles forever. In the infinite laboratory of Bebel, biology, biology of infinite possible genetic structures, of infinite possible animals and plants was the definite eternal theme of the biology section of the laboratory of Bebel. Further, the possibility of subatomic genetic codes, one, two, three, infinity, and absurdum, also naturally, came in as infinite universes of possibilities. I remember 1968 telling this to a friend, Satish Chandra Nair, now retired colonel, as an argument for the infinity of God against the finitude of science. Science. Further, I recognized, recognized damn clearly that life is not mere matter of energy. As a thought of biology, the infinite possible diseases of infinite possible beings in infinite universes and the eternal cure also was included in the agenda of the grand, seamless, infinite laboratory of Bebel. Those days, engineering subjects fascinated me 
only on the periphery as an application of physics. Social sciences, I strongly felt, were illegitimate as true sciences. I am talking about 1966-1967, then I did not even know the word infinitesimal, which came in two years later in infinitesimal calculus, mathematical analysis. But my father, who used to make anudrihat smaller than the smallest and larger than the largest, has an absolute definition of God, quoting the Vishnu Sahasranama, the mantra, mantram of the thousand names of Lord Vishnu, recited by thousands every day, even today. This much deeply inspired me, finally coming back to the infinite laboratory of Babel, I also used to imagine the top floor is a lot of light <laughs> for pure mathematics, which is of course my <laughs> favorite subject, unifying everything. I must mention in passing that I read about binary logic and the mystery of computers in a popular science magazine, Science Today, circa 1967. I instantly wondered about the final computer and recognized the last computer as the largest number it can write. With its finite memory, I can always think of infinity more. But simply, I realized clearly that mathematical induction cannot be eternally induced into the final computer. I also thought of chemical reactions as a possible on-off system hardware for better efficiency to complete the narrative. I also had an imaginary spouse fully engaged, probably inspired by Mary Curie, God knows, fully engaged in eternal research for the final absolute truth that solves all problems of all eternity, of all the things. I used to imagine her coming on a bicycle, bringing lunch for us to share on the top floor of the infinite laboratory among the latest geometry theorems just discovered. The infinite laboratory of Bebeo loomed loom before me whenever I thought of the sciences. Can I just go down? Can you help me? That's all. It's finished. Huh? It's finished. No, a little bit more is there. Oh, that's all. <laughs> Great, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, yeah.